All right, welcome back to Hawaii Real. I have with me the author of Succeeding in College and Life. And what else did you write there, Johnny? Book number two, we got Driving Profits. And Driving Making Profits. Bank. This one is cool because it's like uh, modern day stuff with like Uber and Lyft and stuff like that. Yeah. Driving and Making Bank Profits. Yeah. Driving Profits and Making Bank. Driving Profits, Making Bank. This is my first author on the show, guys. And his other book, Tales from Behind the Wheel. Is this a scary book? No. <laughs> no, not really. Like, what was that show? What was that show back in the nineties? Tales from the Crypt or Tales something? Tales from the Crypt, yeah, that was something it. Like that. that was yeah. it. That was it. <laughs> Johnny Wong. Thank you for coming on the show, John. How have you been, man? Thanks so much for having me, Eel. Yeah. Appreciate it. So John has also uh, dabbled in podcasting, dabbled in radio shows, dabbled in acting, dabbled in stand-up comedy, dabbled in... Um, a lot of different things. So, yeah, sustainability, <laughs> you know, starting your own things. And uh, we actually met like years ago at the Chamber of Commerce meeting or something. Yeah. That was maybe about five years ago, four years ago, around there. Yeah. 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 yeah funny times how, you know, things just... It's a small island, you know, you just kind of meet up with people that you've, you've, um, had history with, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. In fact, we go back even further, you know. Yeah, high school classmates. Yeah, 27 years ago. <laughs> hey, hey, about. hey, now you're... <laughs> dating ourselves, dating yeah, ourselves. Yeah, dating ourselves. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you're, are we that old? Yes, we're that old, guys. Johnny, thanks for coming on, man. We were talking before uh, we started up about, um... Um, you're doing a thing with uh, grocery shopping, grocery delivery kind of thing, yeah. right? And that's that seems like a new thing that's going on, but that's catching steam now with uh, people staying home and whatnot. Especially, yeah. So um, the platforms that we're talking about are Instacart mm. and Shipt. So those are two gig economy companies. You can kind of, if you've never heard of them, you can kind of basically think of them as like Uber for grocery delivery. So, you know, people have heard of like Bite Squad or DoorDash or Grubhub, Uber Eats, they deliver your takeout food. Instacart and Shipt are um, on-demand grocery delivery companies. Um, so, you know, they're mainland companies that have made their way here within the past couple of years. So Instacart's been here since 2017. Shipt came to town last year. Um, Instacart services, Costco, Sam's Club, Safeway, Times, Foodland, Longs shipped is a target owned company. So besides target, they also service Safeway and times and you can also get your um, prescription deliveries from longs to them. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So that helps a whole lot with people that um, got to stay home or people that don't have cars and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, especially now because, you know, with the emergency declaration and people are being asked to shelter in place, um, Demand on both platforms has exploded exponentially mm. ever since the declarations um, came in a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So um, over the past couple of weeks, because demand is so good and money is so good, I've actually transitioned to doing those um, full time currently just to help out with the demand. And yeah. of course, the pay is great. So if you're if you've recently been laid off from your regular job, you know, these are you know, all of these gig economy opportunities are definitely something you can look at possibly getting into if you want to keep busy, if you need extra money to come in, you know, in addition to your unemployment or whatever checks. Yeah, no, totally. You know, we're seeing with everybody staying home, like a, a real drastic change in society. And maybe we're not seeing it so much right now in the first couple of weeks, but I believe we're going to see it a lot more where people are going to be utilizing, you know, telecommunications, um, calling for deliveries and, and just not like going out to eat as much either too. You know, as soon as when you start having food delivered to you and it's easy and it's cost effective, it's like, why am I yeah, going to go exactly. out to a restaurant and wait for, you know, wait in line to get a table and then possibly risk having a bad server who, you know, maybe doesn't, doesn't, uh, cater to your table as much as they should or fill up yeah, with exactly. water or anything like that. Give you bad service. You know, you're risking that every time you go to a restaurant. Um, when you could just stay at home, watch Netflix and order food and get, get food brought to you, yeah, right get to your food door. brought right to your door, the same kind of food that you're going to get if you go to the restaurant. Yeah. You're not going to have the same kind of ambiance and whatnot of, of a restaurant. I think the restaurants that do offer that kind of ambiance, uh, you know, something special. Okay. They'll, they'll have customers, you know, more, more so, but 
Yeah, I think it, we're changing the dynamic of, of society. And you're seeing a lot of jobs can be done at home away from an office. You don't need to be in an office to do all that kind of stuff. You know, definitely, you know, in my opinion, this is actually long overdue. Um, you know, the move towards telecommuting has been kind of, you know, a lot of places have been telecommuting for over 20 years now. You know, I remember back when I was in college, we studied telecommuting, you know, as a communications major. Mm. So that was one of our big topics of study that we we're doing at the time. And, you know, when you think about, you know, the cost of doing business, you know, to have a brick and mortar space or whatever, I'm here in Hawaii, the traffic jams, you know, it just gets worse and worse every year. You know, I used to commute in front of the West side every day for an hour and then it became an hour, 15 minutes, then an hour half, and then it became two hour commute. You know, absolutely crazy. And, and it's like, why? Why am I sitting in traffic, yeah, in traffic to go to an office? Yeah, exactly. Especially, you know, for, you know, maybe about even 15 years ago, most of the things that you could do in an office could be done from the comfort of your own home, yeah. from your computer, in your pajamas with, you know, maybe a professional top. If <laughs> yeah, you don't even need to wear pants. <laughs> and just a secure web connection, you know, right. a good VPN. Yeah. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, act of God intervened, has forced us into all uh, in that direction. You know, yeah. just about everybody with an office job is working from home now yeah. and reaping the benefits. You know, you're not spending hours on the road. You know, you don't need to row no more. <laughs> Think about that. You don't need to dress professionally either. You don't you know, need to you dress professionally. All these yeah. people posting about, oh, I changed from my sleep pajamas to my daytime pajamas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, all of us have been working from home for the past couple of years now that have transitioned to that, have known that already, which which everybody's kind of finding out now because we've been forced into that situation. So, you know, even with, you know, the viral outbreak, you know, people getting sick and dying, you know, really bad. Mm -hmm. But, you know, try to look on the bright side of things. This yeah. might be one of the good things that's come out of it. There is a silver lining. Yeah. There's always silver linings to things, you know. So hopefully, you know, this is one of the changes that businesses will and government agencies will keep after the crisis has been averted. Mm -hmm. You know, leaner operations. Um, for me as a small business owner, you know, I've been working from home for years now with just a virtual team. You know, Megan Cowell, who you had on here a couple of weeks ago, talked about that. Mm -hmm. She runs her law office. All of her employees also work from home. Yeah. So, you know, people have been doing this for a while, just not as a big society that we've been um, operating that way. Yeah, we're kind of getting forced into that now. And we should. I right. think, think it would be and, better. Yeah, there are some good, there are definitely some pros to, you know, everybody being forced to stay home and, and yeah whatnot. less traffic less pollution you know the news has talked about you know those satellite images about yeah. how the pollution looks a lot more cleared up now that people are off the road yeah los angeles was just coming yeah. out you know yeah. the newspaper article saying that you know their pollution is like drastically down for the past three weeks it's like yeah guys yeah. <laughs> so what happens when you don't drive around when everybody's off the roads yeah, yeah. Yeah, and everybody talking about, you know, in the past talking about, you know, we need carbon emission taxes and we need to get, you know, yeah. green energy and everything like that. And now we're seeing it's like, well, no, we just need to we just need to live greener. work at home. <laughs> if you work at home, you're not yeah. driving in traffic, like on the H1 freeway, stuck in traffic for 40 minutes, you know, almost idling your engine. Yeah, yeah. And spewing all this, you know, all these emissions, emissions into, into the atmosphere. Right. So, hey, yeah. we want to live cleaner. Hey. One reason, or sorry, one way is to, you know, work from home. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, or work from home, educate your kids from home. Um, I wonder if, like, um, places like New York that's getting hit real hard, mm -hmm. like, they have, like, a lot of mass transportation, subways and everything like that. Like, is that going to be effective going into the future? Are people going to want to utilize the subway knowing that, holy crap, like tons of people got sick because like our lifestyle is to walk to the subway, catch a subway, to yeah. wherever we're going, work, You're cramped you know, into dinner a tight or space whatever. for yeah. 20 minutes or whatever. Yeah, it's crazy. Who knows? Wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should have been doing that anyway, right? Yeah, I know, really. <laughs> it's not a new thing. <laughs> nope. Shouldn't have been. <laughs> nope. So I wonder about that kind of thing. 
But you were talking about um, uh, Tales from Behind the Wheel. Yeah. Your book. How did that get started? What are you talking about in this in this particular book? Okay, so that particular book, so... There's got to be a story behind that. Um, yeah. So that is basically a collection of my little short stories from um, my time several years back, um, just, you know, moonlighting as a Uber and Lyft driver. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I tend to try to be at the top of the curve when things come to town, so... I was a first generation Uber and Lyft driver when they first opened up um, in Hawaii. And during that first year, you know, I just kind of kept a collection of my short stories. You know, I had it, I had it as, a, as a blog and then I kind of just took all of those and then I compiled it into that little book over there. So the title of the book is Tales from, the, from Behind the Wheel Year One. So it's just um, all of my funny stories and observations about the rideshare culture, mm -hmm. both as a driver and, um, you know, observations of, you know, passengers and that type of thing, um, how the industry kind of works. So, you know, so it's, it, it stories about some of the funny pass, some of the funny rides that I had, <laughs> um, encounters with cab drivers and yeah, it's like 55 outrageous, crazy, funny, mundane, and true stories from a rideshare driver in paradise. Yeah. That's pretty good. And you publish on your own, you're yeah. saying. Nice. Well, we're going to support Johnny Wall in here. Where can people find your books? Um, so they're available on Amazon, so you could buy it and download it. So the, the there's a Kindle version on Amazon. Um, you can find it on Barnes & Noble, so you Great. can get it downloaded to your Nook. Or if you want a hard copy, um, if you're a listener, you can actually just contact EO here over at Hawaii Rio, and then he'll put you in touch with me, and then I can get it sent to you. We can totally do that, man. Yeah. We can totally do that. Sorry. Okay. And your other book here, Driving Profits and Making Bank. So that was, again, um, growing your business and earning money from rideshare. Yeah. Right. Is this is this changing, uh, society changing with uh, Uber and Lyft with the whole everybody stay home kind of thing? Have you seen like a drop in um, people u utilizing Uber and Lyft? Yeah, so as a whole, I'd say rideshare rides are down at the moment just because people have less need to get to as many places. They're not going to work daily, that type of thing. Um, you know, when you're told to stay home and, you know, people for the most part, I would like to think are kind of obedient. Yeah. They'll do what's in their best interest. You know, it's not, not everybody does. There's some people out there that are kind of ignoring things. Mm -hmm. But um, as a whole, yeah, rideshare drivers are finding that there's less rides. Mm -hmm. But the whole premise of the driving profits and making bank book was kind of an overview of not only the rideshare industry, but also just the on-demand delivery economy. So we talked about, you know, Instacart, Shipped, DoorDash, Grubhub, that type of thing. Um, so it talked about how those industries worked and how you could leverage them also to um, if you wanted to kind of just launch your own business. So part of my background, you know, I do have my MBA. Mm -hmm. I do some business consulting as well. So the whole um, premise behind that book was to kind of just help people to kind of develop that entrepreneurial mind through the lens of the rideshare industry. So how can you leverage rideshare opportunities to grow additional businesses? So, um we talked about how you would form your business because as a ride share driver or delivery driver, you are an independent contractor. You're mm -hmm. a small business owner. So not everybody knows how to start or run a business properly. Not everybody got a business degree. So that's kind of the opportunity I kind of saw there to take some of my business background and use that to kind of just teach the business uh, the basics of small business. Right. So that's like a blueprint for people that's, that are going that direction. Yeah. So if you ever wanted to start a small business, uh, I'll, that book will kind of teach you how to start a small business mm -hmm. using the framework of, of, of being an independent rideshare or delivery driver. And then from there, you know, I kind of talked about, um, you know, developing that entrepreneurial mind and being able to identify business opportunities. So the basic premise is if you're a rideshare driver, mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of niches and needs that you're going to see fulfilled. You know, people, you know, people have been driving cabs forever. Right. 
but um, you know, as a ride share driver, oftentimes you're going to see you're driving a lot of people to medical appointments. Um, some people will take your ride share car in lieu of an ambulance. So, you know, you kind of see. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah the, uh, it was, it was kind of shocking for me. Like when people got into my cars, like, can you please hurry? Whatever, whatever. We got to get to the hospital. We got to like, get to the hospital. Why yeah. Are you calling me. <laughs> but, you know, it kind of makes sense. But you also be probably be faster. It'd than... be faster because yeah. you're usually there within four minutes. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be docked with, like, you know, uh, an obscene ambulance bill. Yeah. <laughs> true. True. But the risk is, I guess it's, like, you you weigh the risks, right? Yeah. Like, is it something that I need an ambulance for, or is it something I just need to go, go to the I just ER? need to get to the doctor really quick. Right. Yeah. So I've had people, you know, that came in, you know, they're having, like, a hard time breathing, or they're having, like, chest pains or whatever, or they, like, they, like, you know, sprained their ankle or you know whatever it is you know thankfully nobody was like bleeding out had they been bleeding out, saying no nope. you're getting an actual ambulance <laughs> <laughs> bye bye just turn around and go. No, don't do that but um anyway the point behind that is um you know just driving right here you're gonna see opportunities out there to fill needs within the community whether it's medical transport mm -hmm. or you know like offering private tours of the island because you 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 know here in Hawaii especially you drive a lot of tourists around so you see the demand for like a private tour company is like, ding 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 you know I can be offering private tours yeah instead of people, people on a bus or a yeah exactly or in your car comfort of your car that's nice exactly so that's the whole premise behind driving profits and making bank you know if you want to just be a straight up rideshare driver or delivery driver you know I'll tell you everything you need to know to maximize your earnings just doing straight out work like that. Mm -hmm. If you ought to be more entrepreneurial and and develop like a business idea that you see from driving people around, you know, a lot of, um, you know, this book was written maybe four or five years ago already. So things change, yeah. Things have changed, but you know, a lot of retro drivers have successfully launched into, you know, those other types of business opportunities like doing private tours. Mm -hmm. All right, and the third book you brought for us today, Johnny, is uh, Succeeding in College and Life, How to Achieve Your Career Goals and Live Your Dreams. College? College? college. Is college necessary today in this day and age? You know, that's actually a very good question. You know, it still is from a, I guess, kind of from a standpoint where, you know, the expectation still is that you have a piece of paper certifying a certain skill level within a certain industry. It, 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 it ultimately depends on what you want to do professionally. Totally. Some yeah. careers you need a degree. Yeah. Some careers you don't. Yeah. Like if you're <laughs> going to be a doctor, a lawyer, scientist, nurse, like that, whatever, right. anything. Okay, you like got to go, you, there's a direction towards college. Yeah. Um, but what I've seen is like people get into college debt and yeah. they, they're coming out of college with like a sociology degree. They don't know what they want to do. Yeah. And it's like, guys, yeah, you're missing the point. Yeah. Uh, that was actually very common. You know, when I was in grad school, you know, the first um, master's degree I got was my MBA degree. Hmm. I had a lot of my, a lot of my MBA classmates had undergraduate degrees in these liberal arts fields that ultimately didn't lead them to an actual job job in their field because, you know, how many sociology jobs are there right. <laughs> out there? <laughs> or, right. Political science jobs or philosophy jobs. Like if you major in history, it's like, what are you going to use that for? It's like, I don't know. You can either teach or right. work at some type of think tank, whatever. <laughs> or you just have the degree and now yeah. you just, okay, it's the piece of paper. Like you said, I just yeah. have a degree. Yeah. And that's all the job is asking for. Yeah. Um, but going back to your question about is college still necessary? So yes, in that respect, some fields you need that that credential mm. to get your foot in the door. Um, but you know, when I was in, you know, when, you know, I spent, you know, a good 20 years working at UH, that was my um, beforehand career before I went off on to do my own thing. Um, when I was in grad school, you know, my third master's degree was in public admin with a ed admin focus. And, you know, we kind of debated about whether, or, you know, what is the future of education? That was one of the seminars I took. Mm features features of education mm -hmm. and you know we kind of see this movement where you know there's an ongoing debate 
do you need a degree or can you just get by with like a professional certificate? Because some fields, you don't necessarily need a degree. You just need like a certification mm -hmm. or like a license. Mm -hmm. How do you prepare for your certification or a license? You could take workshops. Right. Or, you know, some type of vocational training or whatever. Um, other moves within the education field, you see like a lot of universities out there offering free classes. So you can sign up, you can take their class for free online. You watch a whole bunch of videos. You get the knowledge. You just won't get the piece of paper because you didn't pay for the degree part. Um, you know, you talked about YouTube University. Mm -hmm. You know, you can produce content some type of training program, put it for free. You get the information out there. People will get the information. They'll know what they need to do. You know, like you learn how to fix your washer and dryer, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you know, we all watch YouTube videos to learn things that we need to learn how to do. So, you know, the future of education, a lot of people have theorized, you know, in, in some far off future, we won't have, you know, the formal school systems that we have today. We're just going to have downloadable knowledge and we'll learn what we need to learn. We'll be able to do whatever it is, what we need to do without the need for this huge system where you're going into debt for a crazy amount of money for a job that may or may not be there. No, you're just going to get plugged in <laughs> and you're going to wake up and say, the matrix, I, right? I know Kung Fu. Yeah. Yeah. It's the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great movie. But yeah, we're, we are, you know, getting closer to that kind of society. And I think people are like still thinking that's way off, way off in the distant future. And it's like, mm, it, it's not. not so much, you know, think about this, you know, right now we're under this mandatory stay at home thing where people are, are going to be home for at least the next month or two. Yeah. I'm thinking it's going to be longer because it'll take about a year to develop a vaccine. So I'm thinking we're probably going to be holed up at home for more closer to a year. Than, than it is for, you know, one month or two months. So, you know, a lot of our universities, our K through 12 systems, you know, they're moving by, necess by necessity to distance education. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's kind of like the future, that's always been the future of our education system, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's slowly peeling back the layers of this huge, um seemly beast <laughs> and slowly transitioning to online learning or mobile learning from from a home environment mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and that's kind of and then from there is just getting people to you know get whatever credential it is they need to enter whatever field that they need yeah i definitely think i don't know like elementary school you know, not the middle school, if that's going to change too much so with distance learning. Um, because you do, like, a big part of a child's learning is being with other children. Socialization. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't know yeah. how much that, that part is going to change, but I do know, like, colleges, they are really revamping and they're really looking at, like, online um, education yeah. a lot more. You know, whereas in the past, you know, these major universities would be looking down upon places like, you know, the University of Phoenix and all these yeah. other the smaller online yeah. type colleges right now they're all like hey what were you guys doing how how are you doing online yeah. classes yeah because okay, we need to do that right or usc yeah we don't do that kind of stuff oh now we now we need to now we need to yeah right so i think that's definitely going to change and i think once it does change um the kids who are going to college are going to expect some online classes obviously there's some classes um that you need to have hands-on stuff labs right you gotta yeah, be, exactly. You got to be there to do it. Um, but there's a lot of like lecture kind classes that you don't really need yeah, to be in class for that. Those are the easiest courses to translate to a DE environment. Right. Yeah. Economics. Why do I got to be in class for that? Basically, anything hands on is the type of thing that you still need to show up in person to do. Yeah. Like it's nearly impossible to duplicate that in an online environment. Right. But then you're looking at like trade schools, like trade yeah. schools are going to bump up, right? Cause yeah. people are actually going there to learning trade so that they yeah. can go out and learn, you know, plumbing, uh, construction, you know, whatever, what have you, um, carpentry, that kind of thing. My buddy's a airline mechanic. So I wonder how he's doing with all this. It's like planes ain't flying, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, yeah, but that's a total trade. Um, 
specific thing that he did, right? He didn't have to go off to college, so he doesn't have a degree, but he makes a good amount of money being an oh, yeah. mechanic. Mechanics so, make darn good money. Yeah. Like people don't realize that. Yeah. It's like, no, you don't have to go to college and come out of college with like big debt and not have a job. You could go to a trade school, come out of that trade school and go right yeah. into um, the industry. Yeah. So, that was actually one of the associate's degrees that we offered at HTC when I was working there. It was um, aeronautic mechanics is one of the degrees yeah. we had. Yeah. Two year degree, not a four year. Yeah. And that's not going anywhere. People yeah. still need their airplanes. They still need to travel. Yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Unless you get like a shutdown like this, because you're really starting to see like what's relevant and what's essential and what's not, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, who's, who's essential? Who's not essential? Okay, well, look at everybody who's working right now. Okay, well, like all the fast food yeah. people are working, like they're essential, I guess, right? Because they're they're yeah. making their they're still their making hamburgers their food. and fries. Yeah. yeah, so that's essential. Yeah. Um, who's out of work? Well, the teachers are out of work. So it's like a flip topsy turvy, right? It's like, well, no, we actually do need teachers, but right now we aren't utilizing the teachers, right? I guess it's also because it's spring break, but I know some teachers and they're like, they're really like scrambling and really trying to get organized to do the distance learning thing. And they're, I think one of their biggest troubles is that um, the parents of the children aren't set up to yeah, do this kind of thing. You know, that, you know, um, that's just a whole barrier to the education system, you know. Um, you know, my second master's degree was actually in online learning, so it was a master's in educational technology. So for a while, I was working on distance education at the university, um, and that's a whole barrier to our education system. You know, a lot of families are out there just don't have, you know, the basic infrastructure at home. They yeah. don't have either. They don't have high speed internet, or they don't have you know, a computer that's capable of running, you know, your basic, just your basic stuff. Or they don't have a webcam yeah. or they don't have, yeah. or maybe they have a family of six people and they have one computer. One computer. Right. Yeah. So, you know, when you talk about barriers to the education system, just, you know, that whole wage gap, you know, the has and have nots, it's, you know, it, it it's very much real. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. But then I think one of the other solutions is that everybody's got smartphones, right? Almost everybody. Most people do. Yeah. Almost everybody yeah. has smartphones. Um, start learning, start uh, applying the digital and distance learning to um, smartphone apps and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, kind of going back to, you know, what you're talking about, you know, YouTube University, you know, the basic, 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 basic method of distance learning just record your PowerPoint lecture, upload it to YouTube. Boo, you can PowerPoint. Save it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it is what it is. You know? <laughs> I hate PowerPoints. It's very easy to... They're easy to do. ...to narrate over PowerPoint slides and save it as a streaming video. Oh, that's another thing. It's like teachers are going to become content creators, right? <clears throat> yeah. Or they, they can be. Like... So the whole thing with like creating content on the places like YouTube is um, to get people to watch and get people engaged and stuff is to have stuff that people want to watch or have yeah. information that they need to get. And teachers, hello, you guys are teachers. Mm -hmm. Like you consistently put out information and education and stuff like that to a group of people, whatever the age be, right? There's nothing stopping you from going on your cell phone, recording you giving, you know, a lecture or a class and stuff like that and putting that on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Because it's in your guys' head. Like, it's in your head. It's not in my head. So get it into my head. How do you do that? Record yourself. Post yourself. And that's why, you know, nowadays you just see, like, a gajillion, you know, life coaches, health coaches, consultants, whatever, out there on YouTube and Instagram all offering these programs for you know, a couple hundred bucks yeah. or X number of dollars a month, you know, enroll in my whatever program, I'll teach you how to, you know, do Facebook ads or lose weight or get ripped or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's all out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's all out there. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people who kind of discover that work from home secret of being you know, some type of lifestyle content creator, influencer, entrepreneur type of person. They've been doing that for 
kind of all out because, again, that's the secret to our education future. We're just going to watch everything we need to learn off of YouTube or something similar. So for a lot of teachers out there, you know, you're already teaching. You're a content matter expert on something. Yes. It's not that hard to take the content you've already created for your class, just repackage it, build a quick website or or YouTube channel, turn on the ads, whatever. Pretty much, yeah. And just sell your content yourself. And you know <laughs> that's pretty much what it is right yeah <laughs> that's like, basically what it is and come on teachers out there don't be like i don't know how to do that <laughs> your teachers you learn yeah. how to do that you teach people how to do that like learn yeah. how to do it camtasia way, camtasia right the way the, the way the rest of us has learned how to put on podcasts and stuff and deal with cameras and lighting and yeah. audio recording and stuff like that it's like no I, I you know like i had to learn all this stuff because i just wanted to it was a hobby Right. Yeah. Um, so I think people professionally are going to be forced to learn the same kind of stuff. Yeah. Out couple, of necessity. A couple hundred bucks. You can get yourself a good lighting system, web cameras. Yeah. Set up your own little recording studio at home. Download your Camtasia software to screen record your computer. You know, you just narrate over it, save it, upload it. Yeah. Boom. Through I, know some, wall. I know some like <laughs> teachers and stuff that are like, um, elementary age uh, teachers that are reading books and posting that on YouTube and stuff like that. You know, yeah. as if they're reading to a class of, you know, kindergartners or first graders. It's, it's pretty cool. Stuff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And copyright wise, a lot of authors are actually being really cool right now with relaxing the copyright permissions for that. So I didn't even think about that. I think, well, yeah, I guess so. Cause if you're reading a book on, YouTube it's still copyrighted, like yeah. It is still copyrighted. You'd have to get like the performance license, that type of thing. Because it's like you're doing an audio book almost. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing your own audio book. But during yeah. these times where we have millions of children staying home, bored, whatever, a lot of the authors, you know, it's been in the news. They've talked about some authors relaxing the need for copyright clearance to record it. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. yeah, interesting times we live in, for sure. Yeah, things are changing <laughs> uh, faster than we think. And... Uh, yeah, it's all just going to be like one one big thing that's going to change and we're not going to realize it. And 10 years from now, we're going to look back and be like, oh, yeah, it, it's always been like this. It's like, no, remember yeah. back in like 2020, we weren't doing this? Yeah. This is the year that everything kind of changed. Yeah. You, know, I, you talk about like, you know, those critical moments in history, you know. I think, you know, the last critical moment in history we had similar to this probably would have been 9-11. Yeah. You know, do Think about it. That was like almost, that was 19 years ago. Mm -hmm. And a whole generation of people have been born who never knew what it was like to be able to just walk to an airport gate yeah, <laughs> to meet your like family and friends. You pick people up at the gate <laughs> at when the they gate. came off the Not plane. the curb. <laughs> right. Like TSA. No, that wasn't. Yeah, that was not, not a, a thing. thing. <laughs> and now you can't even bring like little bottles of liquid on the plane. That's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> All because somebody, you have to take off your shoes and get your it's shoes x-rayed. X-rayed, yeah. Like, you know, the kids don't, I guess they don't understand why we have to do why that. Why we have to do that, yeah. Hmm. Like, I remember, you know, coming back from Vegas, you know, the I went to Trader Joe's in Vegas, and the TSA agents took, like, my wasabi mail that I bought at Trader Joe's. They just wanted it, man. <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> All right, so you do, you said you were watching, like, uh, History Channel and stuff like that. <laughs> We're just talking about this off camera, but history buff. Yeah, totally. You, it was probably my favorite subject back in school, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Yeah. And we were just talking about ancient aliens, man. <laughs> it's like I haven't discussed this on the show yet. <laughs> but I always was like fascinated with stories like the Menehune mm -hmm. and building some of those fish. How like the legends are like some of these fish ponds were built in like a single night. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, okay, why is that a legend? Like, why isn't the legend like, oh, no, my great-great-grandfather built that fish pond? Work. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, why is it, no, like, some people came and built it in one night? Like, where the hell did that come that from? That come from, yeah. I just, <laughs> you know, I t I, I, I'm a firm believer that there's a kernel of truth into whatever you hear. You know, it, 
legends are legends for for a reason they're they're based in some type of kernel of truth yes you know yeah um yeah so it's not like yeah you don't hear stories about oh yeah you know my ancestor worked on a rail <laughs> you know kind of right kind right of right thing. you know 100 years from now you know this oh yeah you know my great great grandfather worked on a rail project or worked on the great wall or worked on the union pacific railroad or whatever yeah like the great yeah. wall of china like there's yeah. there's documented evidence yeah. of how they built that how they bu yeah right okay that's one of the wonders of the world we know how they built it there's construction you look at it and it's like okay yes that completely was built by man there's a reason why they built it yeah the stonework is man is you know man's handiwork and then you look at things like Machu Picchu and like some of the places yeah. in, in like Peru. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's not the great wall of China. Like that's yeah. completely different. That's like laser cut granite yeah. at 90 degree angles inside the stone. It's like, no, we didn't do that. Like, yeah. <laughs> our ancestors didn't do that, especially not in like Peru. Like what the hell were they doing? No, somebody else did that. Either mankind did it with like some great, technological civilization that we've lost or yeah the aliens came down and did that i don't know yeah and you know kind of going to that whole just science fiction thing you, you know for you know you know star wars star trek whatever um you know there's just you know i i've always tended to believe you know anything supernatural that you hear or see within like the portrayals of popular media, you know, they're inspired by something. And, you know, whether, you know, <laughs> inspired by some type of truth out there. Can I stump you, know? you with that yeah. one? Okay. <laughs> now we just Kinda. watched um, Thor. Uh, we rewatched Thor. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. There's, yeah. Some, there's some great parts in there where um, the scientist Jane is talking to her professor about, you know, um, science fiction is a precursor to science fact, and she quotes yeah. Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, well, yeah, some things. Yeah, I was like, well, well, yeah, more than a lot of things, right? Like we have supercomputers in our pockets. Yeah, right. That we can watch all kinds of TV content from with our, you know, our our smartphones. Like in the nineteen. 50s that would have been complete and utter science fiction yeah i mean in the 1950s dick tracy was it 1950s or 1920s whatever 30s, it was yeah right? long dick time tracy. ago <laughs> right he had like his little watch that yeah he could, his little walkie-talkie watch you know we, we'd all be considered james bond oh yeah like <laughs> every wow, single we, one of us would be yeah. james bond we got crazier <laughs> stuff we got crazier stuff now than they had back then right so no i mean and it's only been like we've only had smartphones for like 10 years 10 years so. now yeah 10 years people like we've changed so much because now everybody has smartphones right i mean we're just talking about distance learning and doing all kinds of web content and stuff like that and like kids now have smartphones yeah it's like and i yeah, remember no, that's insane i still remember having my nokia my little nokia phone that yeah you know the only game you had was that little snake game or back in high school, those giant ass brick phones. <laughs> right. That like one out of every hundred thousand people had those, right? Yeah. It wasn't even that common. You saw someone walking around with that, like, oh my God, that's so cool. And then we had pagers, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But now everybody has smartphones. It was only like 10 years. So, yeah, I, I talk a lot off, um, off subject about things like uh, smart cars and uh, self driving cars coming. And that, that is coming. And people don't realize that it's coming fast like yeah. some some people are thinking that no it's still like 30 years 40 years off i'm like no no they've already got the prototypes on the streets like guys yeah. that's like in yeah. 10 years or less yeah i want to say five like as soon as 5g is, yeah. is viable all over the nation the same way 4g was um that's going to change like it's going to interconnect all the vehicles and stuff like that and that's science fiction that's becoming science fact was it minority report with uh, Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Self-driving <laughs> cars. Or iRobot with uh, Will Smith. Oh, let me drive the car. What? You're driving your car? You can't drive? Yeah, I think like my grandkids aren't going to ever drive a car. But it's funny to think yeah. about that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're all going to have Knight Rider, basically. Yeah. <laughs> we are. Like, you look at the modern-day Tesla, and it's got like a... <laughs> 
<laughs> it's got like a little you know? yeah. tablet <laughs> iPad kind of thing inside and you can talk to it and tell it what to do. Yeah. Kind of thing. Alexa, basically, or, or Siri or whatever, you know. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry, guys. Cool pilot. <laughs> if, if you're Hyundai, Hyundai Sonata, right? Uh -huh. Remember the commercial in the Super Bowl commercial, the Smart Pack? It's got Smart Pack. Yeah. And it parks itself. Okay, if a Hyundai can, can park itself, what are like the expensive cars? What are the BMWs? What are the Mercedes? What are those cars doing today? And that's today. Like yeah. Five years from now, 10 years from now. What would they be able to do then? Yeah. Because yeah. our phones in 10 years can do dramatically more than they could 10 years 10 ago. 10 years ago. And it was yeah. just 10 years. And now everybody is like interconnected with their phones. And we don't realize it. So you know, I'm still waiting out. for the point in society where we're all just going to be implant chipped. <laughs> and you can learn kung fu like, yeah. real quick. Yeah, literally the Matrix. You yeah. Know? <laughs> uh, one day. But then be like, do you think we'll have to, or is he, do you think we'll be able to live a far longer life with technology, implants, and stuff like that? Yeah, I, I tend to think so. Um, okay, here, here's where I'm going with this. So, like, people that have, like, gout or something in their legs or, you know, mm -hmm. you know just, like, broken leg or then they don't recover from it fully and they live, they walk with a limp for the rest of their life or a cane for the rest of their life. It's like, you don't need to. Like, going to the future, you're not going to need to do that. You can like, amputate your leg or get, like, um, exoskeletons mm -hmm. onto, onto your legs and actually, no, have a productive walking pain-free life you know that's a thing yeah you know bloodshot did you see the new bloodshot movie with oh they're injecting Vin like yeah. uh, all those little the microbes. nanoprobes yeah that's a that's science fact it's not science yeah. fiction because they actually do have that technology yeah and it just boosts his immune system yeah i don't rapid know if, regeneration and, i don't know if yeah. it's going to yeah. rapid regenerate <laughs> your face if it gets blown off with a shotgun maybe not that quickly not but that quickly. <laughs> But it's going to keep you from getting, you know, supposed to supposedly keep you from getting sick. It's going to clear your arteries. It's going to, yeah. you know, be able to keep you healthy. I'm hoping it'll just like you have these nanobites that cut your hair. <laughs> like every like morning, it just trims off a little trims bit. Trims off of hair. whatever. Yeah, yeah. So you have the same haircut every <laughs> single day. That'd be awesome. Sorry, barbers <laughs> out there and salon people, your your job's on the line in the next ten years. <laughs> I don't know. Just made that up. Actually, I didn't make that up. No, that came from high school. A high school science teacher was talking about that, how there would be nano robots that would hmm. trim your hair. And they'd just be in your skin and, and, implant, and implanted in you. They'd be like cells. Is that Mr. Kim? Or? No, it was not the guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, he taught us how to solder and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't know. Is that a lost skill, soldering? Do people do that nowadays? I've never used it, but of course I've never been in a field that needed it. Right. <laughs> I guess we don't need soldering as much today as we did in the past, making microchips and stuff like that. But it's cool stuff to learn. Yes, sir. Anyway, I wanted to kind of get back to succeeding in college and life real quick. Okay. So never mind with the pyramids. Um so real quick about that how that book came about. So that was actually the first book I wrote. Mm -hmm. Um so the story behind that book, you know, uh, part of my background, I was actually um, a counselor within the community college system for a number of years. So I taught mm -hmm. the intro to college um, freshman success course. Um, so that whole book over there was written to be the textbook for the course. And the whole premise behind the book um, is called Succeeding in College and Life because the premise is the skills that you need to succeed in college are ultimately life success skills. So we talked about things in that book, you know, like, you know, how to study, how to manage your time, how to manage your money, and the, um, how to manage your relationships. The basic idea being that college is kind of like a giant job interview. So you want to be able to prove to your professors that you're acquiring the skills you need to succeed in whatever chosen profession you need. Um, and all, all of your classmates will ultimately be your professional colleagues when you get out into the real world. And, you know, you know, you and I have the benefit of being older. <laughs> so, Thanks again. So, you know, we have 20 years of knowing that, you know, the people that 
you know, in your case, the guys you went to the academy with, you know, they want to bring your work colleagues. Some of them may have become either your supervisors a little bit later, or in turn, maybe you became the supervisors of some of your colleagues that you went to the academy with. And, you know, we've all kind of seen that in our professional careers. Like for my girlfriend, you know, a couple of her classmates that she went to school with, you know, they had job losses. She was able to hire them into her company. Um, in my case, you know, some of my classmates that I went to school with, you know, I hired them to work for my small business in, during their downtimes, you know, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, succeeding in college and life, it, it, it's kind of kind of built around that idea. So everything that the book talks about, you know, when we're going to school, we kind of go through, Okay, what does this have to do in the real world? You know, you know, every class you kind of take, you kind of, if it's not directly related to your major, okay, what does this have to do with anything? Mm -hmm. And that, the book, each chapter kind of ties back all of that. How, do, you know, what is the real life application of this? You know, why is it important to be able to know how to take tests well? Oh, because depending on your field, you're going to have to take a recertification test for your license every three years, five years, whatever. You need to know how to take tests. There's, you're not gonna get away from that. Um, why do you need to know how to manage your time? Why do you need to know technology? Why do you need to know how to manage your money? You know, all those things that you kind of didn't learn in school. Like I have actually a really big section in there that talks about money management because that's just something you don't learn in school. You kind of right. learn it the hard way when right. you go broke a couple times <laughs> in the real world. <laughs> That type of thing. Yeah, totally, man. So, yeah, so that's the whole um, Succeeding in College and Life book. So it's written to be either um, the textbook for a intro to college course or a college prep course at the high school level. So that's kind of that. All right, so your target, target audience for this book would be high schoolers or people just getting into college? Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. Or parents that are getting their kids in. Ready, ready for school. Ready. Yeah, 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 ready for college. So that's the story behind that. Yeah. yeah, and we're in a place right now where people are at home and they have nothing but time to on do. their hands. Yeah, with time yeah. on their hands. Like, <laughs> don't just don't just absorb content, people. Like go out and learn stuff. Like use this time wisely and start learning and bettering yourself. I don't know, learn to play the piano or something. I don't know. But... Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> learn another language. Some type of skill. Something. I don't know. Yeah, Duolingo. Yeah, I love that app. Yeah, but definitely, you know, um, I'm glad you brought that up with the book is, you know, having that blueprint for um, how college um, reflects your actions later in life and the things, the lessons that you do learn in college um, are lessons that you'll take on with you uh, into into normal life and in the yeah, normal world. wherever you go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think back in my college days. I'm like, well. I don't know. And, you know, I spent a lot of years working with, you know, at a at a school that had, you know, community colleges, they teach two things, like liberal arts on one half of the house, vocation on the other half of the house. And, you know, you always had that whole thing, you know, what what is the value of a liberal arts degree? Yeah. It doesn't prepare you for anything right. per se. It doesn't prepare you for an actual job. But I, I've always felt the liberal arts degree is the part of your education that prepares you for life in general. Yes. Because it's, you know, it's reasoning, it's speaking, it's communication, it's history. You know, you, you learn how to see patterns and events and put them into context. Um, I think one of my best classes in college that I do remember and I do utilize quite often is statistics. Yeah. People don't realize yeah, yeah. like when you're looking at the news article or something and it's getting that it's just spouting off statistics. Yeah. You're, you're watching something and they're spouting off statistics. You have to look at what they're where that's coming from. Where yeah. the information is. What coming do the from. numbers actually mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can finagle statistics so to much. whatever way you want it. So yeah. yeah. Like don't believe almost yeah. the fact where don't really believe statistics unless it's really broad. Yeah. You have to kind of yeah, read into the numbers. Yeah. Really, <laughs> really read into the numbers. So kudos for statistics class in college. Yeah. And, you know, there's, you know, on my Facebook thread, there was actually quite a debate on that just, you know, the other day about the recovery rates mm -hmm. of, of the COVID-19. Yeah. They, yeah. You, 
the CDC keeps publishing all of these different statistics about infection rates, recovery rates. You know, what does that all really mean in the big scheme of things? You know? <laughs> they make it play for, they make the numbers play for whatever they want. Yeah. yeah they make it work for them. All right, Johnny. Thank you for coming on the show, man. It's Thanks for great. having me, man. Really appreciate it. Again, everybody, Jonathan Wong. He's the author of Succeeding in College and Life, Tales from Behind the Wheel, and Driving Profits and Making Bank. Thank you again so much, Eel. And um, for you listeners out there, again, if you guys are interested in getting a copy, uh, I'll be glad to autograph it. If you want a hard copy, just contact Eel at the show, and he'll put you in touch with me, and we'll get you a signed copy of the books. Right on. Right on, man. And as always, stay happy, Hoy.